The first one is um, Tom Disley talking about global open sidewalks, and you have five minutes. Thank you. So I want to start with a problem that we're all familiar with. Cities can be incredibly complex to navigate. You can probably tell from my accent that I'm not actually from Seattle. And without the help of Google Maps, I probably wouldn't have found this conference hall here today. I know I'm preaching to the choir, but we can all agree that technology has been transformational for our ability to get around. But I want to challenge this notion that navigation is a solved problem. And here's Kevin's story. Kevin's someone with limited mobility who uses a wheelchair. So Kevin says, Using a tool like Directions on Google Maps doesn't really help me get around. Actually, sometimes this does more harm than good. I'm sent down streets I can't cross or up inclines that are impossible to climb. It can be deeply frustrating. The key takeaway here is that we often forget about the sidewalk when we map the built environment. And for individuals within the limited mobility community, this can have pretty negative consequences. Kevin's also part of a pretty big group of people. In fact, if we include everyone in the States who has difficulty walking more than a quarter mile, there are 54.5 million people in this country alone who would benefit from better sidewalk data. But we can go one step bigger. If we have better sidewalk data, we can do really interesting things such as custom wayfinding. And in this golden age of spatial innovation, and I'm referring to Pokemon Go, I don't think we should, uh, <laughs> I don't think we should be prepared to settle for generic directions on how to get from point A to B. Whether I want to do something as specific as a stroller-friendly walk in Hong Kong, go running, take my dog for a walk, or teach my kid how to cycle, and then I should be able to get custom data on how to navigate the city. Well, our team thinks that OpenStreetMap is uniquely placed to deliver this. Well, the first step is obviously to have a look at how sidewalk data is currently being mapped. And for anyone who has used the OpenStreetMap ID editor, this is a really familiar view. It's extremely easy to use. You're given aerial imagery, and you basically just draw features wherever you see them. So if I wanted to add in these two roads that I see in the image on the left, I would simply just click and draw lines where I see them. But this simplicity doesn't carry over for sidewalks. In fact, if I also wanted to add the sidewalks that we so clearly see in the image on the left, I'd have to first click into the road, which is a bit weird, and only then could I tag it as an attribute of the road. It's also convoluted for curb ramps. We remember from Kevin's story that understanding where to safely cross the road was a really important piece of information for getting around. But if I want to add these curb ramps that I see circled here on the left, I have to click into the road again, add a new point, label it as a crossing, and only then do I get to label it as a curb. So that's a confusing process for the user. We propose three simple changes. Let the user draw in sidewalks as lines, crossings as lines, and curb cuts as points. This minimal set of changes will allow us to much better side represent sidewalks as they are in reality. We can see this image on the left is hardly represented under current practices in the middle. But if I let users draw on sidewalks as lines where they see them, crossings as lines, and add curb cuts as a points, all of a sudden it becomes as intuitive as adding a road. And that's how it should be. But this is obviously only part of the problem. So even if we come to a common agreement on how to describe sidewalks, we have a problem of coverage of data. We see on the left a visualization of current sidewalk data. This is only really useful for routing someone around downtown, which isn't a great way to spend a day. However, over on the right, we see a big opportunity. And this is a visualization of all the open data that the city of Sa Seattle puts out in the public domain on sidewalks. Wouldn't it be great if we had a way that we could use this? Well, our team are coding up the tools to be able to do this. We're going to be able to import the municipal data. We're going to be able to convert it to the new standard we're proposing and print it out in the OSM XML format ready for upload. We're also taking inspiration from some of the other projects which have used the crowdsource verification uh, procedure. And we've heard some great examples here today. And hopefully, as well as obviously adding human verification, it will get more people into mapping. But obviously, all this work isn't really worth it unless we have someone ready to use the data. And this is where our partnership with Access Map Seattle comes in. They're an NGO based here in Seattle who are poised to benefit from the changes we are proposing. In fact, if we're able to get these changes through, the limited mobility community in Seattle could have accessibility routing in just a matter of months. So why do we care about this issue? Well, I'm in the Data Science for Social Good Fellowship, and along with my team, we've been working on this project for the summer. These are our four deliverables. We've done an analysis of how sidewalks are currently being mapped. We're proposing this new standard. We're creating the import tool so we can quickly get the standard to scale. And then finally, we're actually going to conclude by importing the data for Seattle, Denver, and Savannah so that we can build these accessibility routing tools. 
So I know that was a lot of information in a very short amount of time, and I really encourage everyone here to come up and chat to us over the next couple of days. There are many, many different ways that everyone can get involved, and we're always looking for more advice and ideas on how we can improve our process. I want to just quickly ask my team to stand up so that you know who everyone is. Uh, this is Meg, Jess, Kai Cheng, and these are our project leads, Anat and Nick. Please come find us. Let us know how we can improve what we're doing, and thank you so much for listening. It was not on. I thought it was. Next up is Aaron Young. Um, and after that will be uh, Tyler Radford talking about women mapping in uh, Zambia. OK, my name's Aaron. And this is Tristan. Uh, we're with CART. The challenge that was brought to us about 12 months ago was how do we elevate data from a good framework of OSM data to really comprehensive data that's very usable in a whole scope of different um, projects. So in the last 12 months, we've traveled to 33 locations throughout the Caribbean and Latin America and uh, collected all this information and brought it back and post-processed it processed it in a really intensive way. So some of the things that we collect when we go on the ground, um, obviously we're, we're really focused on what we can see. So we look for, quote, real street names, street names that are on signs on the streets. Uh, we look at new construction, one ways turn restrictions. We even look at road classes because we drive these streets personally and look at traffic patterns and where, where is traffic really going. Uh, surface types, lanes, speed limits, and then obviously accurate locations for points of interest. Um, and that's a screenshot of San Jose, Costa Rica, one of the places that we visited. Okay. So here's a screenshot of uh, two iPads that we used last week while we were in Lima, Peru. Uh, we're using the GoMap application on iPad, which creates a breadcrumb trail of every uh, area that we visit. Um, here on the left, you can see really intensive area in Miraflores, and then at the outskirts of Lima. This is through two vehicles, and um, this equates to 14 days of groundwork of about 10 to 12 hour days on the ground. Um, and then the post process, so, uh, processing of this equates to about 2,000 mapping hours in which we put in everything that Tristan just uh, discussed as far as POIs, road surfaces, road names, et cetera, et cetera. Occasionally we get to have a little fun um, on an island off the coast of Belize. Um, they don't have cars that you can rent to drive around, so they only let you rent golf carts. Uh, so here we have that's actually me sitting in the golf cart, and we have um, some Garmin uh, verb cameras that we use to collect uh, pictures with. And then this is the island that we drove. There's a couple of them, but uh, the island of uh, San Pedro right there off the coast of Belize, and we were able to do it. So what we find on the ground is things change all the time. Um, here's an example in Santiago, Dominican Republic, where we we're finding that those the published road names were different from what we saw on signs on street corners. And we came up across these gentlemen who were installing new street names on this neighborhood street. And we looked over to the side and there was a gentleman standing there. And we asked him, uh, you know, are you in charge of this installation? He said, I'm the president of the Homeowners Association. These, these gentlemen, they work for El Encanto, who is a local retailer, and they're sponsoring the new street names put up. And so now, as we, as we mentioned before, we're looking for real street names. And so this uh, Calle Nueve here is what people would see if they were actually navigating through Santiago. And so we put in what is the real street name. And then, of course, in the historical tags, we might move a current street name down. 
as I said, we post-process this information afterwards. Here's an example in Guayaquil, Ecuador, where uh, we're currently post-processing. Um, this is about a thousand hours of editing that's occurring right now with uh, um, our team of OSM editors. And uh, we put everything in that we can possibly gather from the street view imagery that we're collecting at this time. Um, some of the things that we don't notice that you can see is some of this information has become outdated either in imagery, and so we wouldn't be able to see the U-turn or even that overpass coming in. Um, those turning lanes in the top wouldn't be visible just through um, bird's eye editing. And so we include all that stuff as well as turn restrictions, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And here's an example from Phillipsburg, St. Martin, one of the areas that we went to originally. And you can see be before we went there, it was just single line work of roads. And now we have every business, even down to um, benches, gates, et cetera, et cetera, all those fun tags that we like to get really nerdy about. Um, so we get as intense as possible. And this is an example of what we've been working on in the last 12 months. Thank you. You guys are being awesome about being on time so far. I'm very impressed. Um, next up is women mapping. Sorry. Next up is women mapping. Um, Tyler Radford, and after that, we'll be back to the um, program that's published with um, armchair mapping. Hi, everyone. So first of all, let me say, I don't feel quite qualified to be speaking here. Um, this talk was supposed to be given by one of our community members, Trudy Hope. Um, she's from the Uganda OpenStreetMap community. She's now working in Zambia. So she passed along a few slides, and I, I hope you don't mind. I'm just going to read uh, a short message that she, she would like to send to talk about the work that she's been doing to help get the OpenStreetMap community in Zambia started. OpenStreetMap Zambia, and let me show you. Look at, we'll start with some photos so you can visualize the work that she's doing. Um, so this is Trudy and some others at work. OpenStreetMap Zambia started in November 2015. One of the first activities was developing a concept to train women with the intention of mapping health facilities that are of importance to them and their children in the low-income areas of Lusaka. After discussing the idea with the German Development Cooperation, GIZ, and the Millennium Challenge account, we further focused on water supply and sanitation infrastructure and solid waste disposal. GIZ and MCA sponsored a kickoff event on International Women's Day, the 8th of March, 2016, where mapping was officially launched in Ntendere compound with the support of the Ministry of Local Government and Housing and Lusaka Water and Sewerage Company. 50 women in the community expressed their willingness to support the project through mapping the neighborhood. So this is some of the mappers at work um, mapping water and sanitation. Um, by the way, on the opening slide, I use the term or, or acronym WASH, uh, meaning water and sanitation mapping. And for those of you who are, uh, attended my chat earlier this morning, this is a really core, uh, of core importance to achieving the sustainable development goals, water and sanitation um, specifically is goal number six, and goal number three around, um, is around better health care, um, which are both kind of at play in this mapping project. So um, the mapping objectives, first the mapping serves as a means to sensitize the community in managing the waste and sanitation facilities. This is of high importance for the development of communities for the reduction of diseases like diarrhea and cholera. Secondly, the data is needed as baseline information for planned upgrading of parts of the city's sanitation infrastructure. With major investments in this field, OpenStreetMap data can serve to monitor change in the city's development. So just a few other photos from the, from the team on the ground. And I'd like to thank Trudy very much um, in her absence because she's been instrumental um, with her years of knowledge and experience in Uganda, um, now moving to her neighboring country in Zambia and helping to get the community, community up and running there. So, Thanks to Trudy for her work. And I'll leave it at that. Thank you.
next up will be um, the state of armchair mapping with Toby Murray. Next up is the state of armchair mapping with Toby Murray. All right, so armchair, ma armchair mapping. If you've been around OSM, you've probably heard the term. Um, if you're an old timer, this will probably be a review, review for you, but if not, listen up, because I'm only gonna say it once, because I only have five minutes. So armchair mapping, uh, what is it? Uh, presumably, we've all mapped from a chair. It might even have arms. Does that make us all armchair mappers? Well, there's a wiki page, of course. It's a very long wiki page. So, um, let's just cover the basics. It's uh, editing somewhere where you're not at and you're not familiar with. Um, OSM thrives on local contributions, so when you're doing it remotely, um, it's referred to as armchair mapping. It can be used to great effect. Uh, the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team uses it for d disaster uh, mapping. There are many QA tools that point out errors that can be fixed remotely. Um, but it can also lead to problems. Um, most frequent is probably outdated or uh, offset imagery that leads people to incorrectly connect roads or um, even delete data. Uh, and there's a lot of just complex situations in the real world that can't be determined from aerial imagery. So how do we how do we do better? Well, we make sure to check all our data sources for one thing. So there's the uh, control, the controls over here in ID, JAWSM has something similar. Um, we're specifically going to look at the layers and the map data menus. So the layers menu offers up aerial imagery and other uh, imagery sources, and uh, what you might not know is that this menu changes depending on where you are in the world. So this is in Kansas. Uh, you'll see it defaults to Bing. Um, there's the some USGS imagery that's available and the Tiger overlay. Um, however, if you go to Innsbruck, Austria, it actually defaults to basemap.at, uh, and the Tiger data is not available, and neither is the USGS. Um, this is just another example in Canada. British, uh, British Columbia has some uh, imagery that's available for, for use. Uh, and next I mentioned the map data menu. Currently there's only mapillary options. However, in presentations earlier today, there were hints that there will be more options in this menu in the near future. Um, so, uh, Oh, this is uh, the JAWS in view of the same options. Um, the, all the options below the second separator are geo-specific. Um, and JAWS in has the additional benefit that you can go into the settings and actually see the ge geographic extent of um, available imagery on a map. Uh, JAWS in also has a feature, and I believe this only works with Bing because they're the only ones who serve up the correct uh, metadata in the uh, tile headers. But if you use this show tile info option, uh, you'll see the last entry there, the metadata capture date, gives you an idea of when this imagery was, was captured so you can know how old it is. So here's an example of using the tiger overlay to map a missing neighborhood. Uh, it's pretty simple. You can just draw the ways and add the names from, from the tiger data. Here's a little bit more complex situation. There's a service road uh, going across an apparently grassy area. So what's wrong here, the imagery or the data? Well, that was Bing. This is Mapbox. It's uh, lower resolution. Doesn't really help us much. Um, whoops, I just skipped door slides. Um, here's the USGS large scale imagery. Also not really deterministic. Here's the mapillary overlay. And we'll, we see there's an image here. If we click on the mapillary.com link, we see that it was taken in February of 2016. So it is definitely current data, and it's a designated bike route. So we can come back to ID and label it as a cycle path, and go on our way.
Next up is Roman Poarecki building a trail catalog with OSM. Hi, my name is Roman, and I'm going to be presenting a prototype of trailcatalog.org, a, a, a way to record OSM trails canonically. Uh, who here likes to hike? All right, I'm in the right room. I, I love to hike, and I come across this problem. How do you find a trail that, that fits your needs? Uh, typically, I've used paper maps. They're great if you have them. They're the most detailed, and you should have them with you at all times when you go hiking. There's books, of course, uh, but you know, if you have too many in your bag, they'll be heavy. Uh, they're great for contextual details, like photos and descriptions. Um, but they're usually just localized. Uh, and there's numerous sites, of course. But a lot of them focus on editorial content. Most do not share their data freely. And some of them are behind paywalls. So this leads to uh, all these great little data silos all over the internet, but they're kind of disconnected. Uh, meanwhile, OSM actually has thousands of trails available to us. They're right there at our fingertips. But OSM trails are not easily accessible uh, by name, distance, or elevation. If you want to find a five-mile trail with 2,000-foot elevation gain near Seattle, uh, you'll have a tough time actually locating that on the OSM map. You'll find it, but it's not really accessible um, to the common user. So what I'm proposing is a layer of information right next to OSM. This layer can contain uh, trail names, uh, the actual selections of trail segments, distance elevation, and other geographical uh, information. For example, a campsite. So I'm going to show you guys a quick little prototype that's running online right now. Uh, I'm going to select a trail from OSM. I'm going to save the route with a name. It's going to show the distance and elevation, and then I'm going to show you how that view can be served up to a different site using iframe. OK, so here I am at trailcatalog.org. I'm going to add a trail. I'm going to put down the microphone for a sec. And I'm going to center at North Bend, which is really close to Seattle, great little hiking location. I'm going to click on start of the trailhead, and then I'm going to route to the top of this mountain. And I'm going to call this mailbox peak. And I'm going to save it. And now I have the trail recorded. And I can see that it has uh, cumulative elevation here and the distance. And if I go back to the home page, this trail is now recorded. Uh, I'm going to show you another trail. Um, that I saved earlier today called Spider Meadows. It's a beautiful trail in uh, the North Cascades. And using this little embed feature here, you can grab this uh, iframe code and then paste it into a blog, for example. So here's a blog uh, that I found devoted to this hike. And I've embedded the map view of this hike. And you can see it's here. And then there's a little contextual information uh, the elevation gain and the distance, and you can link back to this page. So if people start using this, uh, if anything changes about this trail, uh, everybody who's viewing it will see that update happen. Uh, I would like to add that the data here is published under ODBL license, so my intent is everything will be free and, and accessible to anybody who wants to use it. <clears throat> Great. So let me go back to the presentation here. So my next steps are to refine the catalog scheme. For example, how to deal with duplicates. Um, add search, filtering, and sorting. So for example, you can start looking for trails within a national park. Um, add markers visible to all trails. For example, if somebody adds a camping marker and that marker hits numerous trails, all trails will see that marker. And then finally, add a basic API so that any site from around the internet can start viewing the data and potentially adding back to it. So we start. Uh, having a comprehensive, easy-to-search catalog of trails worldwide. Uh, if you're interested in getting involved, please email me, uh, romanp at trailcatalog.org, and check out the site. Thank you.
Next up is Stephen All talking about rail networks. Good afternoon, my name is Steve All. I'm gonna go real fast here. Um, I'm an OSM contributor and I have been for over seven years. Let's talk about making OSM's rail better in the USA to grow our community. Oh, what happened? Next. Next slide. There we go. Um, in the USA, we already have rail in OpenStreetMap from our Tiger import years back. Um, it's rough, but it's okay as a starting place. Um, Tiger Data's existing rail name tags are frequently the name of the rail operator, so that's often a good first thing to change. And there's a renderer called Open Railway Map, or ORM, that displays existing rail infrastructure. And early Tiger Data display as black and brown lines. I'll, I'll show you some of those. Um, at a global level, ORM looks like this, with main lines shown as orange lines and red lines where high speed equals yes. And at a regional level in the USA, the Northeast Corridor is red, where high speed equals yes. And zooming in on the Northeast Corridor, you can see rail infrastructure with ORM's um, max speed style. And that shows maximum train speeds color-coded with, um, with numbers. And these are expressed in kilometers per hour, not in miles per hour. Um, start improving Tiger Rail by assessing infrastructure. You can render it at, at various zoom levels in, in ORM. And so edit rail in, in, with your favorite editor. And if you're using JOSM, this is how you, you see a rail segment's tags, its key value pairs. Um, and initially important are tags with keys name, usage, and service. Hello, there we go. Um, after any changes that you make in a day or so, OpenStreetMap will, will begin to render these. And here you can see the Seattle subdivision is shown with its name tag. The usage tag having a value of main is why this displays as orange. And as you learn about rail in your area, know that abandoned and historic and heritage and similar kinds of rail are special and they kind of require some very careful tagging. Um, perhaps the rails are still there and they're only disused, but they're not officially abandoned. Um, industrial rail, mining rail, military rail, torn up but once there rail, miniature rail that's fun for kids in the county park. You can, you can map all of these things. Um, collect rail segments with identical name and usage tags into route railway relations. Um, how to do so won't be explained here. And doing this becomes really helpful because it allows subsequent selection of large chunks of rail with a proper and consistent logic. Um, each of ORM's zoom levels between 7 and 12 show slightly different combinations of tags, and they should be really carefully examined for correctness in any given area. And each of ORM's displayed colors and transparencies and dashing or dotting quickly makes visual sense after a little bit of practice. Um, improve rail to ORM display it from raw, tiger, black, and brown so that it starts to display with, with orange, yellow, green, blue, pink, and red that ORM shows you. And dotted lines can show truly proposed rail, and dashed lines can show rail construction. Um, it is important and helpful. Follow the wiki links to read up on how we do things. See how other people tag and examine the structure of other rail wiki. Wiki tables can communicate status and progression of rail efforts in state at a time efforts. Um, for example, take a look at California railroads. They're in a later alpha state of completion and move ahead with better tagging, good structure, suggestions, and stated goals towards completion. And you can do the same in your state, too. I, I hope you do. Um, and infrastructure is not equal to train routes. Infrastructure ways are tagged with railway, collectly, um, uh, correctly collected together into a middle level of railway routes. Higher level passenger train routes displayed with open public transport map are collected together into train routes or other routes if the infrastructure is subway, light rail, tram, etc. Many OSM volunteers find it easier to work first on the middle level of infrastructure with route equals railway relations seen with ORM on the left before building higher level passenger train routes seen with OPTM on the right. 
Um, it may be confusing understanding the differences between infrastructure relations and train route relations, but a natural progression is to complete railway relations first, then train relations to the version one of public transport scheme, then upgrade version one train routes to version two. And all of this is documented in our wiki pages. Where to begin? Well, here's several good steps. Um, these and more are outlined in our United States Railways wiki. And here are a few more. And I guess I'm done. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, and we have made it halfway through. Um, next up is Building OSM in a Geospatially Underdeveloped City um, by Matthew Toro. Can you guys hear me? Yes, it's on, right? Okay, so really long title. I probably overinflated it. My name is Matthew Toro. Um, I'm coming to you from Miami, Florida, as some of you may have overheard earlier when I asked the question to the LA uh, bulk import guys, um, whom I, uh, I admire immensely. But I'm representing uh, kind of two organizations, if you will, simultaneously. Most importantly, Map Time Miami. I want to shout out my Map Time Miami ladies here. Where there's kind of a Miami delegation. So, yes. Yeah. And so, as the title suggests, Miami is not uh, the most uh, developed city in terms of having a lot of human capital who, is nece who are necessarily interested or involved in building the OpenStreetMap effort. effort excuse me. So Map to Miami has been really critical in kind of galvanizing attention and interest in that. Um, and one of the big projects, or kind of the first project, and hopefully uh, a project that will set a good precedent that will create more projects, is this... Um, bulk import into the OSM. So as many local government entities increasingly have, um, Miami now has a great uh, open, um, open data portal uh, on, built on the Esri um, open data platform. And so we don't have, what is it, three million building footprints like they have in LA, but we have a, um, a respectable number of, I believe, uh, 95,000. Um, and we want to import those. So here's a little uh, QGIS visualization uh, of some of them um, in the downtown kind of central business district extruded. And part of the pitch that I made at the initial Matt Town Miami meeting was the multitude of applications that people could, could, could use these data for. And I mean, this, uh, again, I'm preaching to the choir. Um, that's kind of been, been a theme. But I think as a new person to the OSM community, someone who is just now getting his feet wet, I think all of us could collectively benefit from better pitching, better marketing the multitude of applications, especially in the urban planning, urban design realms. Again, this isn't news for any of you, but I think we need to do a much better job communicating. Um, it could be overwhelming and intimidating because this is a very tech-savvy audience, and there are a lot of uh, parallel fields that want to tap into the technologies that we're developing, but we need to communicate it in kind of down-to-earth, lay people, accessible language. So this is just, you know, a simple, you know, desktop overlay of land use patterns. And, you know, as many of you in those fields like urban planning, urban design know, uh, there are so many applications for looking at um, relationships between public transportation, land use, um, affordable housing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, 95,000 records, most importantly, the coveted building height field is great. Uh, we don't have an elevation field, um, but fortunately in Miami we're, you know, ground zero for um, sea level rise, and so we're, we're, pretty, we're pretty flat. Um, not fortunately for Miami, but in terms of our data. Our <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so, um, so we're embarking on this process, and, you know, I come to the OSM community um, nervously, as you guys can hear, but from a background in geography. And, you know, I'm more of a, an applied desktop analyst, um, whatever that means these days. So, you know, I saw this data set and I was like, yeah, you know, like, great. There's this great open source, open access um, platform, uh, OSM. We could totally take this data set that's publicly available, throw them in there. Super easy, right? Well, not so fast. Um, you know, the, this is me with my hubris and arrogant arrogance. Um, not so fast. Then I start to read up on the actual details and the technical complexities of implementing this. And part and parcel of that, one of the prerequisites, of course, is community outreach, which is great. I'm, I'm pretty good with that. But on the technical side, I don't have the skills um, independently to do this. So my arrogance was quickly um, humbled, uh, deflated, fortunately. So I had to reach out and make a pitch. And, um, you know, my whole attitude changed. It's, it was a whole different approach. But, um, and, and the real crux of this presentation, if, uh, if there is one, is that um, through the need uh, was born 
uh, a group, if you will, an incipient kind of uh, community. Cheers. Um, and I found some, some great help by having a pizza, first and foremost. Um, and we have a great partnership in Miami with Code for Miami, um, uh, the local Code, uh, Code for America brigade or chapter in Miami, obviously. And um, so we had a, a great outreach event uh, coupled with a, a, the uh, weekly Code for Miami mil meeting. It was fantastic. I kind of out of the woodworks emerged some really awesome people. Um, and I definitely want to give a shout out to those guys, especially the technical lead, um, a colleague from Mapillary. So I know there's definitely Mapillary, uh, pres uh, Mapillary presence here. But uh, Levente uh, Yuhas and Adam Old and definitely my map time ladies right there. Thank you, girls. Um, so we're, we're building something. And as the, title, as the title tried to emphasize, it's a very underdeveloped um, kind of community that we have. But we're on the map. And kind of this is. I know uh, my map time colleagues were here last year at State of the Map US in, um, in New York. Awesome, map time diplomats. Um, but yeah, so we're doing it. I'm out of here, don't worry. Uh, we're doing it, but this is kind of our debut, if you will. Uh, I hope that we're gonna have a stronger presence next year, and this is kind of um, just letting you guys know what we're up to in Miami. There's a real geospatial presence in Miami. It's being grown, it's being built, and projects like this are growing the community. Thank you guys so much, it's great to be here. Thank you. Um, next up is Give Your Tile Life by Humble Joe. Hi, I'm Humble Joe. I work as a front end engineer at Maps and New York office. And I'm here to talk about 3D Tile Exporter. I hate live demo, but it seems that this video is not working, so I think I should. Uh, so this is how it works. You can search for the location using the search bar on the laptop. I'll just search for the familiar area for me. Wow, our search engine is awesome. <laughs> and after you selected the location and zoom level, you can preview the tile. And in case the result is not exactly what you wanted, you can navigate the areas in nine direction using this part. And this tile exporter generates the OBJ file, and then you can download the OBJ file through this link. OK, let's go back. And this is a wizard that I printed the downloaded file with a MakerBot. And these are some nice stuffs that we printed from the Shapeway. They look really nice with the metal. And here is one fun thing that you can do with Tile Exporter. When you set the zoom level very high, you can get almost the building itself. And in this way, I could get almost the Empire State Building itself. And I had this specific image in my mind that I sipped the whiskey on the Empire State Building shaped on the rocks. So I put the model in the cup and then powered the silicon in it. And it should be edible quality silicon, FYI. <laughs> and so I could get a silicon mold out of it. And ta-da. I couldn't. Thank you. Thank you. Sadly, I couldn't get a picture with whiskey because it started melting down right away. Well. That's right. And I want to talk a little bit about what is going on behind. So everybody, oh, it's give. It doesn't play. It's okay. Oh, it plays. Uh, so everything starts from vector tiles. Vector tiles are squares of mass which contains the geospatial data instead of pre-baked raster images. They are usually in the forms that can be easily used, such as GeoJSON or TopoJSON. So Tile Exporter hits the Tile server to get a GeoJSON object based on the location and the zoom level the user, user selected. And after that, after getting the GeoJSON object, that GeoJSON object is converted into SVG. And I use a D3 library to do it, which is I'm sorry, maybe I should explain what is SVG. SVG is shorthand for scalable vector 
graphics, and then I use the D3, which is great data visualization library for this process. And then vector tiles have a high data in this layer, and with those high data, I could extract the XVGs into the OBJ. And 3JS extrusion geometry API was really helpful in this process. You can see the tile export is quite a kill to a lot of open source projects. Uh, in this process, I found the vector tiles are very awesome for digital fabrication, such as like CNC, 3D printer, laser cut. Those digital fabrication tools usually expect vector graphic as inputs because it gotta know that like coordinates to move its mechanical arms. And vector tiles are very easy to be converted into vector graphics as I did as I did for my target exporter. And here's another example for I really don't know why video is upside down. But you can also upside down your face, right? <laughs> Uh, and also, vector tile separates its, uh, its information into its two own layers. So you can be interested in things like uh, giving different colors to each layer. And as some of you already saw it, maps and work is machine to our booth. So if you're interested in, and if you still couldn't see it yet, check it out tomorrow at our booth. Whoa, I didn't mean it. And if you got interested in making something with a vector tile after this talk, please check out these links. Uh, some of, uh, like second links is from my coworker Karim and third one is from my coworker Rachel. This talk is way too short to talk about how awesome their projects are. Please check out. And Map says, I think Map has been great inspiration for many people's creativity. And I think vector tiles can even inspire more people in this digital fabrication area. I'm very looking forward to see what is coming more in your future. And this is my Twitter handle. Please let me know what you're making. Thank you. We've got three left to go. Next up is Lu Wang representing um, streets in OSM with curb lines. Hello. Uh, I was really excited to hear from the team that was doing the uh, sidewalk mapping for accessibility because I think shared goals here um, and uh, kind of coming at it from a slightly different angle. Um, how do I forward slides? Let's see. Is it this button? That's the button. Okay, so I just wanted to start here. This is an image uh, from my hometown, San Francisco, um, in Haight Street. And you can kind of see there's a like sort of street festival going on. The really important thing to take away here is just look at all the people that are taking up this street. But if you zoom in on a map of what that street looks like, you just kind of get like a really thick line, right? And so all web mapping actually just suffers from this. I also work at MapSend. We use a lot of data from OpenStreetMap. As you, can, as you know, OpenStreetMap data represents streets as lines. Uh, and so this is you know, Times Square in New York City. And it's a big open area, but it's just shown here with a bunch of lines. Um, and that's kind of the, the problem at scales when you zoom in far enough, is that these lines don't really represent the space that uh, we're looking at. What are lines, right? They're things that are designed to get us from point A to point B. And a lot of web mapping is focused on doing just that. You put in point A, put in point B, it focuses on getting you to that as fast as possible. And as, this is a really cool quote in The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. It's like, what's so great about point B that you have to get there that fast? So we actually optimize our space for that, right? So um, you make this kind of trade-off where you say, I want to get somewhere as fast as possible. We're going to design all of our environment to make that possible. And you're trading off a lot of things in quality of life of what it means to live in a, in a certain environment. And so when you try to do things like, let's put in a bike lane, let's put in some trees, people get really, really mad. Why is that? Because they think what you're, they're losing is capacity of travel uh, as opposed to the other things in the environment that could benefit them. Um, this is interesting uh, concept in art, which is like the image of a thing is not actually the thing itself but it gives us like a relationship to the actual object when we see an image of the thing. And so with web maps, it's like a similar concept, right? There are lines, and you start thinking about, well, streets are lines. That's what they are, right? Um, but what if we just thought about representing streets in a different way? Not lines, but instead volumes of space. Why would we care about volumes, right? 
this is a thing you might do. You wouldn't actually do this in a routing thing, but you could try it, and it'll be like, okay, if you want to get from this point to that point across this plaza, walk across these lines, and here's how you do it. But I mean, in reality, you just walk right across it. You know, this you don't need to follow the paths at all. Um, but this is not a new concept. Urban planners, for instance, have been drawing maps showing space since the 16th century, maybe even earlier. Urban planners today uh, do that. They're actually representing a lot of streets in the ways that an architect might visualize a room. Uh, you're seeing the sidewalk, trees, where the parking spaces are. If you play video games at all, uh, this is something you might be familiar with. You look at an in-game map. This is actually, uh, I don't have a screenshot of the game, but it's at an intersection of two streets. But in the game, you're treating it as a volume instead of two lines that intersect with each other. So let's talk about OpenStreetMap a little bit. So this is just a screenshot of a very complicated inter intersection somewhere in Germany. Um, and the reason why I'm showing this particular one is because in OpenStreetMap, in the wiki, there is a community proposal right now of representing streets as space. I didn't invent it, someone else did. I just kind of wanted to signal boost it here because I think it's actually really, really good. They put a lot of real thought into it, representing what, what each part of the street is. But you're not losing any of the lines. You still need that for routing. So the nodes and the lines that connect those uh, points are still there. But what it does change is the renderer's ability to represent not the nodes and the things, the bones for routing, but rather the outline of the shape of the street and what makes it up. So OK, so maybe there's a proposal to do that. But do we have the data to do that? And the answer is actually yes. Uh, the entire country of Japan actually is very, very good at doing this. Um, and so Google uses uh, street curb data to draw maps. Uh, there's plenty of data in the United States as well. Uh, this is data from Washington, D.C. Um, you can get download data from public uh, open data portals like in Philadelphia, which is what I did. And using uh, our graphics engine Tangram, I imported that data and changed our base map so that instead of using lines to represent streets, I'm actually drawing the shape of the streets themselves. Um, so I'm starting to put together in uh, a GitHub repository um, a list of all the data sources that there are uh, out there for this uh, stuff. And so there's a, the URL for that is bit.ly uh, slash curblines. Um, the issue is that the names for them also just are super different depending on where you look. Nobody has a standard name for this. It might be any of these things. Um, and it's not as simple as, oh, I have some data. Let's put it online. There's actually a bunch of other steps that I am also trying to think through. Um, I don't have time to talk about them all right now, but if you're interested, please come find me later. And so here's the end goal, right? Here's what happens when the street is just a line by itself. But if we start representing it with more detail, we can get a lot more information. We start thinking about these streets as environments for people. And let's close off with this quote that I really like. If you plan cities for cars and traffic, you get cars and traffic. And that's what, kind of what our maps are indicating, right? But if you plan for people and places, you get people and places. Uh, oh. Also, this is my repository for my map, and that's it. Thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, we've got two left. This is Training Red Cross Volunteers with Emma Nile. All right, good afternoon, and I'm Emmer Nile, and last year I went uh, with the Red Cross on a, a Missing Maps project to Tanzania to train local volunteers. Drishti, who's been up here, uh, was with me. And so I'm a volunteer. I don't speak for these organizations, and any misrepresentation are my fault, so you can talk to those people if I say something wrong. Okay, so uh, field collection in Tanzania is a lot like Seattle. That's a joke, it's the land of the day. <laughs> All right, Tanzania, for those of you who don't know, is uh, off on the right-hand side there. Uh, East Africa flew from Portland and then to Dar es Salaam and up to Mwanza near the um, Lake Victoria. There was a hot task going on prior to the training where we did that desktop mapping or the armchair mapping to collect the streets and roads. And 
this is why, because this is a screenshot from Google Maps, and you'll see where Ushirombo is indicated there on, on the right. And now here is the correct location of Ushirombo in OpenStreetMap. So a town of 100,000 people, Google has one single line. Right in downtown Ushirombo, it looks like this, and we're actually collecting um, data on the buildings and roads. And wherever we went, it seems like we had kids. The little guy in the green shirt there was just the right height, and he volunteered <laughs> to be my portable desk. It was pretty funny. Uh, they, were, they were great to have around. And we, we utilized field papers, which is a great tool to uh, print out the open street map, and then using the reference uh, grid and then the QR code, we added in the building numbers and then any of the buildings that were emitted in the original imagery because of the age. And then in conjunction with the open map kit, we're able to go and attribute uh, the building numbers and then the condition. The exciting thing about this project for me is this was about preparedness for any potential disasters that, that could come up there rather than trying to react to a uh, some sort of natural or human caused disaster. This is community preparedness and building resiliency. Uh, one of the key things is access to clean water, a water point here with public access where you, people would go and buy water. But then all the buildings also had house numbers, but it was based on the uh, Ushirombo Town Center and then the, this code. And the problem that jaws them through was, hey, you can't have a house number without a street name. Well, the streets don't have names. Um, a lot of a lot of Africa is doing a great job of getting communication with the cell towers, but without electricity. So here is a police station with the um, the solar panel, and then that bicycle in the front is actually a taxi. The uh, pedestrian or the the passenger rides on that padded seat on the back, and that's the way you get around. So it's a pretty um, user friendly. The buildings were often uh, created with uh, built with mud. And the problem with that is when flooding happens, then the house kind of melts. So we also tracked uh, the flood prone areas. And you can see that the people are replacing the, the mud buildings with the uh, brick, brick structure. Uh, my GPS track here, along with the four arrows, point to these four places. Rocks, which will become a foundation, and then in the far background, a building that with no roof, and then one with the roof. And we would often see these, and you'd, you'd see these on the imagery, where you'd have a foundation where people are starting to build a house, and you can see the different layers, just like archaeology in this building, where they've added the bricks in. Um, so this image shows where we had a, um, a, actually a mosque that was constructed after the imagery was created, and you never know what kind of wildlife you're going to find in, the, uh, in front of a mango tree. A uh, great thing about this project was we incorporated local uh, community leaders as well as people from the community, so we didn't have any problems walking around, unlike these people on this secondary highway. And then they also have things called sleeping policemen, which is actually a, a pretty significant speed bump. Uh, then we went into the back to the office and uh, used the, op the uh, field papers to georeference and add the attributes using JOSM. And uh, Tanzania is very civilized because you wash your hands before you eat. And uh, great fish, Drishti had ate lots of beans and rice. And there's our team of some really great volunteers in Ushiromba, Tanzania. Great, we're on our last one, which is data and gamification with um, Daniel Tello. So hi, I'm Daniel Tello. Uh, came from Mexico City's government experimental office. I'm the CEO, and I will tell you about a mapathon we did in Mexico City, in order to map all the semi-formal buses around there, and they look more or less like this. But this is like just an image of it. Uh, so we have a problem in Mexico City that uh, we have a huge transport system. There's around 30,000 buses and minibuses that move around 40 million users each day. So it's around uh, two times Washington, I would say. I'm not sure about that. But 
uh, that's not the only problem. We have an uh, insufficient and ineffective transport, then there is no simple solutions, and neither are effective. Uh, so we have incomplete and sketch, sketchy information around concession public transport system since everyone can ride a bus and anyone can buy and yeah you can run a business around that. Um, so what's Mapathon? Mapathon is a joint effort between government and nonprofit, civil society and especially companies also that uh, the idea was to create the first database of Mexico City's concession public transport systems and this is not new. Uh, other countries and other uh, initiatives as Digital Matatus of the Emiti Media Lab try to do this in South Africa, and there is another one also. So uh, what's Mapathon? It's a mobile application, a gamified crowdsourcing tool that allows these citizens to gather all the information and send it to us in order to uh, map all the trip information and all the metadata and geographical trail. So the government knows the origin and destiny, but they don't know uh, all the trail of the bus. So that's because of the size of the city and also because we are a megalopolis. So this is a process, the user uh, log in, create a team, and this is because it's a game and you can earn points. So this is how you can uh, gamify a really, really huge problem. And after that, we ask to the citizens to take a photo, and that's, this is because we, not, we need to verify the people is mapping the right bus, and because it's a crowdsourcing exercise, of course, you need to verify it. And this is the leaderboard, so people can be engaged, and also how you can continue with the mapping process. Uh, so Mapathon by the numbers, we reach around 4,000 users, and yeah, it's not one per user, but uh, we reach around also uh, 4,000 mapping trails, and we made up uh, 700 teams, so that's a pretty good, good number. So during two weeks, we also collect the equivalent distance of one put times the Earth circumference, so it's a pretty good number and also a huge database. And also if you take uh, that we are collecting also photos, so imagine the size of the database. And this is more or less how uh, the map looks like. So it's pretty complex. It's not a really good solution. And right now, uh, the next steps are around trying to modify the GTFS format because uh, we don't have time schedules and we don't have uh, timetables. So the problem here is uh, how we can uh, pull together a specialized group in order to give a very specific format for uh, semi-formal uh, concession public transport systems. So everyone interested in hearing more about the project and also look up on my web page, it's tejo.l.io. Uh, and yeah, that's all. Thank you. That's everybody for lightning talks. I think um, some of the speakers I know have already left, so it's probably best to keep questions to the social, which starts in about 15 minutes. But thanks for a great day, and have a good night. <laughs>